Good morning, James Ennis. Good morning. I hope you're a violinist who doesn't need any introduction, but you're really famous the world over as a concert violinist. And I believe you just put out your 59th recording. <laughs> that sounds um, possible. Yeah, I, I've sort of lost, lost track of the numbers at this point. <laughs> I was looking on your website actually this morning and counting as like, one, two, like I knew you'd done a lot and you're relatively young. It's very impressive. So this is a very special recording that you made a year ago. Can you tell us about that project? Uh, well, I'm actually, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about because I've released two, two. recordings okay. within a couple of weeks that, that are both kind of interesting stories um, in that they were, I guess, uh, pandemic products. <laughs> Uh, and the logistics of putting them both together were uh, kind of unusual. The, the one, the solo recording of mm -hmm. the uh, Isai Six Sonatas for Solo Violin, that was something that, uh, yeah, that was that was completely unexpected, not planned at all. But uh, last year when things were, were breaking down, concerts were all getting canceled. I, uh, I was here in my home and, uh, you know, that things were falling out of the diary like day by day by day. And uh, there were a few of the European festivals, um, Prague Spring Festival, uh, the Dresden Music Festival, uh, those two in particular. Uh, I'd been due to play at them, I guess it would have been late May of 2020. So maybe in April, they said, well, we've canceled the festivals, but if you'd be able to create some uh, content, you know, maybe you could you could film a performance of yourself, and uh, you know, we'll we'll play it on our channels, and we'll give you a little money. And uh, having nothing else to do, I said, yeah, yeah, sure, I can do that, no problem. I do that all the time. You know, of course, I'd never ever done anything like that before. I had no idea how I was going to do it. Um, but you know, it was like the one thing we all had at that point was was time. So I thought, well, surely I'll I'll figure this out. Uh, so with the, the help of, of a great friend of mine, uh, a wonderful producer who's produced most of my albums for the last many years, a man named Simon Kiln in London, he, uh, he and I got talking and he made some recommendations of maybe, you know, investing in some, some proper equipment, you know, nothing that was going to break the bank exactly, but, um, but some nice stuff that, that could serve me well in terms of recording myself. Um, you, you know, we didn't know how long things were going to be going on like this at this Point, but um, we figured it could be a while and it's not a bad thing to have the capacity to record oneself. So um, I, yeah, I got like a, some mics and an audio interface and you know, downloaded a, a program on my computer and just started the, the process of figuring out how this all worked. Now in my house, uh, very fortunately, like we, we built this house not long ago and, and built a, a room, kind of a big central room where uh, the idea was if we kind of cleaned everything out of it, you know, put, took out the furniture, put, took, up, took up the carpets, like that, um, that it could really sound quite nice, you know, have little house concerts and, and it does sound quite nice and, and it actually sounds really nice. So we, we stripped the room and uh, I started recording samples and sending them to my friend Simon saying, oh, you know, what do you think? You know, am I doing this right? You know, of course, at first I was doing it all completely wrong. And, um, but we, we worked on, Kind of refining you know mic height and distance and placement and just, just all of that sort of stuff placement within the room and um eventually we got to a point where he said you know it sounds really good in there like it sounds as good in that room as in any studio that you're going to find you know i think you could actually do some serious work in there if you wanted to do that and so i thought well okay this, this is an interesting an interesting idea so i ended up filming um some of these programs for these festivals that i'd mentioned and you know learned through that process um how to how to film myself with a you know an iphone and you know just really just what we had in in the house i mean i did spend a bit of money on the mics and the and the uh, audio interface but um the filming part it's like i i think i spent like sixty dollars from amazon for a couple of like the cheapest tripods they had and little connectors for phones and i mean it was really on a shoestring budget but um between this camera we had in the in the house just like a an old you know slr camera and uh my iphone and my wife's iphone we had this nice three camera set up and so i made these films for the for the festivals and i thought you know these are not bad and um so then i, I enlisted the help of <laughs> it's a long story <laughs> you sorry you asked yet um we uh, 
my, my wife and I got, got in touch with a, a filmmaker friend in, in London and he was saying, oh, well, you know, you can do this and you can do this and there's this app for your phone that gives you full manual control of this. And, you know, maybe you can buy a really cheap like uh, stage light, um, you know, go Amazon again, like $29 or something. So we set up for some sort of proper filming and, uh, and I ended up recording all of the Bach sonatas and partitas and all the six uh, Isai sonatas. Uh, for these these filmed recitals, I, I called them my recitals from home, and I, and I sell them on uh, via my website there on on Vimeo, and that was um, an enormous project. I mean, it was it was one of those things that now I mean now the the music business has by no means recovered, but it's recovered at least to the point where now it seems just unfathomable that that I could have spent so much time on this one project, um, but. But I'm glad I did, and and I knew that that the audio could eventually be used for because you know it was all recorded in high resolution and all that, so it re could eventually be released as as albums. So yeah, the Isai sonatas that uh, from the recitals from home, those were you know, mastered for CD and and released quite recently. And the Bach is going to come out later in the year. But um, but the other album that just came out um, is the uh, first of four CDs of Beethoven quartets that my quartet recorded. Um, and that was another crazy adventure because um, we we had booked about a week uh, to spend in England recording with Simon, who I already mentioned. And as uh, this was booked for last August, and as the summer went along, it was clear we were not going to be able to get over there. He was not going to be able to come over to us. Um, but we none of us wanted to scrap it. We, we were like, well, you know, we've worked so hard. And we'd been playing uh, cycles of the Beethoven quartets over the last several years. and. Um, it just it was the right time for a project you know sometimes that's just how it is it's like the time is now if it's not now it's not going to happen um so you know the amazing modern technology so a amy the other violinist in the quartet she um runs a, sort of an elite uh, music school uh in macon georgia the, the robert mcduffie center for strings uh at mercer university and mercer university has a really lovely concert hall that uh that happened to be free at this point in August because school was not yet in session. And uh, so Amy booked us into there and her husband, who is a uh, drummer, percussionist, a, a amazing guy, also is a recording engineer. And so he, on the ground in Macon, Georgia, managed to coordinate a, a, a broadband stream to Simon in London, who was monitoring the sessions in real time at like, 48k and i mean it was it was amazing so we had simon's face on a skype call on a computer and um and yeah so he produced these sessions so the first um the first cd we ended up recording oh that was another nice thing because we didn't have to fly all the way over to the uk and we didn't have to fly all the way back so that actually gave us i think about four more days in yeah. the recording schedule so um, we had originally been thinking we would record two CDs, Beethoven quartets, and we got started and it was like, well, let's just keep playing until we run out of time. We ended up recording four CDs. So uh, we recorded everything from Opus 74 to the end. And uh, the first CD of uh, Opus 130 and 133, uh, yeah, that was just released. And I think we just approved the master for 127, 131. And I think we're just waiting on uh, one of our members to <laughs> approve the master on the 74 and 95. Well, I was going to ask you about the quartet. Um, I haven't heard you yet, but I'm going to buy that, those recordings. Well. <laughs> yeah, hope you like so how do you manage it in a normal year when there's no pandemic or, you know, we, we hope we've gone through the worst of this at this mm -hmm. point. Um, what with your touring schedule, so intense as a soloist with orchestras and recitalist, how do you manage to have a quartet? Well, the quartet is really, um, it's been, I'm trying to think of how, when we sort of formally established ourselves as a quartet, maybe 10 years ago or something. Oh, okay. I, we're all really old friends. <laughs> like we've known each other for years. I mean, Amy, the other violinist, she and I went to summer camp together back in like 1989. So, you know, it's, it's like our families are, are, are like family and, mm -hmm. and, the, the cellist Edward Aaron, uh, he and I were sweet mates at Juilliard back in the 90s. And, um, we, so, you know, I think a lot of, of quartets, I mean, playing a quartet is hard. 
and in, it, for, in a lot of ways, and I, and I think it's a, it's a sad reality that for a lot of quartets, it, it, um, it becomes so immersive that there's a certain amount of um, personal distance that mm -hmm. develops and that is required. You know, there's all these famous stories about, you know, <laughs> four members of a quartet yeah in four rental cars and taking four separate flights and <laughs> staying in four yeah. different hotels. And, you know, I think that that, I, I think that that's not, that's not always the case, of course, by any means, but um, our quartet is kind of the opposite because we would get together to hang out anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was kind of how the quartet got started is just kind of the idea of some, some projects um, where we were, eager to do the projects, but just as eager to get together and just hang out. Um, so, you know, sadly, our real life ha has set in for us, which is uh, in, in that our, our violist, Richard O'Neill, um, eventually was like, I think I'm, I think I want a real job with real stability and real, you know, and, and so we, we were thrilled. Richard uh, took the, the position with the Takash Quartet, uh, so that, that was another reason why these, these Beethoven quartets, it was like, well, this either happens now or it doesn't happen at all because Richard was joining the Takish Quartet and moving to Boulder and being in residence there at the mm -hmm. University of Colorado. And it was, you know, this was a, a wonderful, this is a wonderful chapter in, in his life, but it, um, so for the last 10 years or so, it's basically been finding any pockets of time where our calendars line up and getting together and cramming like crazy um and everything about it has been difficult to to the point of being you know unrealistic and nearly impossible and that i think has kept our motivations for doing it extremely um pure <laughs> because you know none of us are doing it for any other reason than we just really really want to because you know it, it's it has always involved like just these ridiculous things it's like well you know let's see if i took an overnight flight from los angeles to new york and then we rehearsed all day and then i played a concerto with the philharmonic at night and we could rehearse during the second half and then we could fly to south carolina and perform it the next day and it's like that's a terrible idea but we would do things like that mm -hmm. just because um you know, it was fun. <laughs> um, and then I, I'm the artistic director at the Seattle Chamber Music Society, and we have two festivals a year, one in January, one in July. And um, that often was a time for us to sort of be more properly in, in residence together, mm -hmm. uh, you know, learning, learning some repertoire and spending a little bit more time. Um, so it's hard to know what the what the future of the quartet is, because it's just hard to think about it um, without without Richard. But yeah. uh, but you know, it's it's funny. Our, we thought that this was going to be you know something we would really have to figure out um, for this season, uh, the the 2020-2021 season. But then of course everything was canceled, so it's like oh we don't have to make that decision. So uh, what we ended up uh, talk how's this for like kicking the can? We were like well how about this? How about we play string trios? where Amy plays violin and I play viola and Ed plays cello. So that's, uh, we've been doing some of that this mm -hmm. summer. And you just mentioned uh, the Seattle Chamber Music Society. So when this is released, that will be going on online. And mm -hmm. I believe people can stream those concerts until September 13th. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, do you want to talk about any of the rep you'll be playing there or people you'll be oh, there's, there's so much, it's, it, it's funny, I, I'm, I'm, this was lucky planning. I've got all my <laughs> my planning stuff right sitting on my desk here. It's it's hard to keep track of because you, you know you plan one festival and then by the time you've sort of got those programs put to bed, um, you're thick into the next one. <laughs> so um, I I uh, have been thinking like okay what is on these programs this summer because I haven't thought about it for a little while. But um, we like to we I mean I. I, I shouldn't, uh, I, I would like to spread whatever credit there is, but I should at least accept blame for the programs myself because, um, you know, that is that is my job. And what I like doing with programs, and this applies to my chamber music programs, it applies to the recitals I play or really whatever is, um, I like variety, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I would like to think over the course of a season that um, the people can see some sort of 
uh, recurring themes or, you know, they can feel like there's a value of experiencing an entire season. Uh, and that being said, though, I, I think, I think it's a, a shame when somebody goes to a concert, you know, concerts are, well, I mean, our streamed concerts are cheap. <laughs> They're very inexpensive, but during normal life, you know, you go to a concert, it's expensive, you know, tickets are expensive and, you know, maybe you've got to go into the city and park your car and it's a whole thing, right? And I feel like it's a little bit unfair sometimes when you go to a concert and you feel like you've gotten, you've received one piece of a puzzle. <laughs> You're like, I don't know quite what to make of today or tonight. Um, so I, I think that one of the challenges of programming a series is making every, you know, for lack of, our concerts are usually at night. So I'll say for every night, um, make, that night a special night, a mm -hmm. special night and a complete night and a whole experience and, and a, a wonderful experience. But also for the for the diehards, you know, the people that are really in for the whole season, that they that they sort of get additional context and additional kind of depth to what's going on. So um so yeah, there's there's a lot of variety in our programs and um I, I, one thing that I've really focused on with the streaming uh, concerts is there's a certain focus on um, was happening in in Leipzig, you know, in the middle of the 19th century, and just what an incredible time that was when you had the Schumanns and you had Mendelssohn, and you know there was just this incredible um, this incredible atmosphere of music making, and and uh, with this chamber music that is often so intimate, you know, as we've been filming our last couple of festivals, I've, I've realized that the way that people experience music on a screen is very different than in a hall, and of course, the, one of the great joys of, of chamber music is it is, I think, for, for the, the listeners as well as the performers, a very intimate um, kind of interactive experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a real, there's an exploration of, um, of that intimacy with these, with these filmed concerts, you know, playing music that you can, of course, you know, music is, is fantastic because you can adapt it to your circumstance. And, and yeah, I mean, you can play the, the, Schumann last violin sonata or the, the third piano trio you know you can play these in concert halls and you can make them work but uh, to have them in your living room with close film work and all that mm -hmm. I think is maybe a little bit closer to the essence of the music so so we're having some fun with that and um and you know I, I I've got uh I, I always try to throw in some interesting new music. Um, there's actually a great friend of the National Arts Center, uh, Jocelyn Morlock, has mm -hmm. uh, written a wind quintet for us uh, this year, which is our, we commission a piece annually. And uh, very, very happy that Jocelyn could, could write this wind quintet for us. Um, Stuart Goodyear is coming down and we're playing some of his music um, as well as him performing on the piano. So. There's um, there's great stuff and yeah I hope uh, I hope our, our viewers today might be uh, interested in checking out the series at mm -hmm. uh, Seattle Chamber Music or yeah SeattleChamberMusic.org. It'll be linked in the description. Okay. Of, yeah, as, along with your website and everything. Um, I wanted to follow up on a few threads that came up so far. I have to say when I heard you play Izai Balad first time was an encore when you were with our orchestra in Southern Hall. Oh, wow. And it was completely unexpected for us. Maybe you planned it. And we're like, what? You know, <laughs> and then, you know, I heard you play it in your, um, in your concert, what, recitals from home Ooh. and the sound you achieved. It was just unbelievable and such a different experience, you know, because I've always heard you when I've been in the orchestra and I don't normally see you, right? It's just like your back's to me and I'm appreciating your tone going out into the hall. But this was such a different experience. And also your Bach, because I have your first CD that you put out quite a while ago, like almost 20 yeah. years ago now. Yeah. And it's wonderful you'll be releasing this new set as well. For non-violinists, they may not realize we practice solo Bach. We learn, for me, it was like every year. You're always, as part of what you're doing is solo Bach. Did, was that also part of your upbringing? Yeah, Bach? yeah. I mean, I, I was always, um, I think really kind of all through my student years, I was always... I was pretty much always playing something of Bach and something of Paganini. <laughs> I think just as a way to just, I mean, what better ways to train the hands really than mm -hmm. those two composers. Um, so yeah, Bach has always been, I mean, I, I think that so many violinists during the, the shutdown of the last year and a half, I mean, it, so many violinists turned to Bach because it's, mm -hmm. it's like, for one thing, you know, what better music 
to, to turn to. Um, for another, of course, it, it, it's something that is complete for a solo instrument. You know, so much of what we do is kind of part of, a, of an ensemble or a yeah. duo at least. And so to be able to play the music that is sort of the greatest music there is and that is self-contained, complete as, as a solo instrumental thing. Um, and then also, I, I think that, you know, as you, as you said, it's like it, for violinists, it's kind of part of our, part of our history, part of our lives. You know, it's been, Bach has been, I think for most violinists, a, a constant since, uh, since early days. So yeah, it, it, it's always great to come back to Bach. And, and it's funny, there was a period of time, um, you know, I made that recording a long time ago. Um, yeah, I think that was about 20 years ago, um, more maybe, <laughs> and uh, 22 years ago or something. And um, for, I, I think it was probably close to a decade, um, maybe between say like 2000, in 2014 that I just got really lazy. And there were like three of them that I played all the time. Mm -hmm. I played the second and third partitas and the first sonata just all the time. And the other three, I just kind of didn't play just because, you know, when somebody needed Bach, it was like, well, I, that one's kind of in my hands. And, mm -hmm. you know, then, then of course that, that becomes this kind of cycle that it's hard to break out of. And so I guess it was, yeah, it was probably around 20, 12, 2014, I don't know, something like that, that I was like, okay, well, this is kind of ridiculous. And, and so I started playing, um, actually, I got asked by a friend to do just the most ridiculous thing. You know, he, he was like, oh, can you come to my festival and play all the Bach sonatas and partitas like in a single night? I was like, no, absolutely not. I don't want to do that. And he, but he's a good friend. He was like, oh no, you should come. You should do it. You should do it. And, and it's like, oh, this, this sounds like a terrible idea. I'm not sure. I, I can't. Do. Um, so I did it and discovered that it's actually kind of a really nice way to experience that music. Like it, it sounds awful, right? It sounds like kind of punishing the player and like punishing the audience, but, but you can just kind of get into that world and just kind of live there for a few hours. And, um, so that was kind of wonderful. So I started doing that in a bunch of places and, you know, either, either in a single evening or in two evenings. And it was around that time that I thought, you know, I, I think my, my thoughts and feelings on the music have, have evolved to the point where it might be worthwhile to re-record them. Um, you know, old recordings, it, it, I feel like it's sort of like uh, looking at old photographs. It's like you, you see them and you're, hopefully, if you've had a happy life, you see old photographs and you're like, yeah, I remember being that person mm -hmm. at that point. And that's a happy memory. Um, but it's not necessarily who you are now. And so I, I guess, you know, I, did, <laughs> I remember somebody putting on a recording of Bach at one point. And I wasn't really listening. It was just sort of on. And I remember thinking that I really liked it, um, which was turned out to be a good thing because it, it was me. I listened to it and I was like, I really <laughs> like that. I wonder who that is. And it was interesting is when I realized it was me, it was, it was, um, I mean, there's a funny story about Misha Maisky apparently hearing his recording, uh, his first recording of the Bach Suites and getting really angry and being like, this cellist doesn't know what they're doing. This is and asking the person in the record store, what is this terrible recording? And they were like, uh, it's you, Mr. Maisky. And that's why he recorded them again. And so happily, I didn't have that experience, but it was more the experience of, of I, I don't really recognize that person anymore even though like it was kind of a part of me um so all this to say that i thought well you know maybe i should record them again but it's like well that's a big undertaking and when is that really going to happen you know and how am i since i love to record with simon it's like well what am i going to go over to the uk and find time and go into some hall and uh, how is this going to happen um so for this shutdown it was like well that's easy of course the thing that was kind of weird about it is that I, they were entirely self-produced you know i didn't have a producer listening in saying oh why don't you give that movement another try or what do you think of this and that so i mean in a way i guess these Isai and bach recordings are the most the most solo solo can be because i mean i didn't have any input from anybody so for for better or for worse and you were recording it from midnight till four i believe about that, yeah, it was, um, you know, the, I, uh, I'm, I'm lucky I live in, in a very quiet area, but, um, but still, you know, there, there's, 
there's noise, there's lawnmowers, there's whatever. And, and we actually live along a river, so there's boats. <laughs> um, and so between that kind of outside noise and realistically, you know, the inside noise of having a couple of kids and we're all locked in the house, um, there wasn't practically going to be any way to, um, to record during the day. Um, the other thing is, since I was filming all this stuff, I wouldn't, wanted to have control over light. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that can be a tricky thing if, if the light is changing through the course of an afternoon. Or, um, so, yeah, we, we realized that the only way to do this really would be to record at night. So I would try to maybe go to bed at seven or something or eight, maybe, and uh, wake up at 11, 1130 and <laughs> have a cup of tea. And I, there was this whole list of things I had to do where it was like, okay, well, I'm going to turn off the breaker for the refrigerator so that doesn't hum. And I'm going to turn off the air conditioning and I'm going to you know, turn this light on to this level or this light on to that level and make sure that oh, oh. and I'm actually in retrospect, I'm kind of amazed that I didn't have a night that that I, you know, recorded all night and, and got nothing because like all these, th there's a lot to think about, you know, making sure that all the cameras are running and all the batteries are charged and that the, you know, there's space on the hard drive, all these, all these things. I think that, um, that uh, I, I did enough dry runs to, to know what it was that I had to be doing, but also I think I got kind of lucky. <laughs> and as someone who you, you're normally traveling a lot and dealing with time zone changes. So was that sort of putting you back in that zone of, um, you know, your body's able to cope with this. <laughs> I think the, the thing I was I was laughing about to some friends is, you, you know, my kids are, are a little bit older now. Um, I mean, they're seven and nine, so it's not like they're you know they're not big kids, but um, but uh, I, it brought me back to the days of when they were babies, where it's like, oh well, you're just tired all the time, and you know, I I think that that yeah, the, between the time zone thing and and the being a parent. Um, the fact is that you, as a performer, you know, you, if I'm on the road somewhere and people are like, oh, how do you deal with the jet lag? It's like, well, you know, if I'm playing concerts, I mean, the, the work that goes into it is the preparation. Mm -hmm. By the time I play a concert, it's like, if, particularly if there's no rehearsal that day, it's like I can be completely jet lagged because I only really have to be 100% on for an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of the day, you know, and I can be a zombie the rest of the day if I need to be. Um, so I don't know, For I, I think that you, you begin to train the body a little bit into knowing that it's like, okay, well, I have to be on now and I can collapse later. Um, the recording days, they, like I would, I would record just one piece a night. Like basically, because I didn't have a, pro a producer, my process would be like, okay, well, I'm gonna record Bach C major sonata tonight. So, which was a daunting night, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I, I got up, I was like, well, I'll play it through, I'll play through each movement, you know, four times or something. It's like, well, you know, if I don't, if I don't have it by now, then that's on me. You know, that's a reflection of my preparation and, and I have to live with that. And uh, so, yeah, I would just kind of run through these pieces over and over. And, and, you know, honestly, it was not the, psychologically it was not a bad way to spend the time I and mean, we were all going a little bit crazy and you know down here in the states where i live I and mean, there there was at this time of year i mean it was not just the 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 covid lockdowns but i mean the, all of the, the the social fabric of the country was tearing apart and to to spend a few hours playing bach was not a bad thing mentally <laughs> you know yeah. it, it sort of helps get my head together a little bit that that c major is just uh, amazing and, and that few three parts i played that for my final recital at mcgill like the whole sonata but no one had advised me that you should really practice doing a run through of the whole sonata right so i'd always practice each movement and i got on stage and i thought i have never actually played this through so i always tell my students that like you know, no matter how tiring it is, just do whatever the run is, right? I remember the first time I played Brahms concerto and the first time I played Elgar concerto. It's the same thing. I got to the end of the first <laughs> really? movement. And I, was like, I was just completely done. And, uh, you know, with Brahms, it was a funny one to say, you know, I, I, I obsessed over that piece as a kid on the LP. So it was like, first movement is side yeah. A. 
And I would just listen to it over and over and over and over. And then eventually, you know, I'd flip it over to side B. And, and uh, but yeah, that first performance of Brahms Concerto where I got to the end of the first movement and I realized that the tank was completely empty and I had two very challenging movements to go. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point about, about the Bach. Um, yeah, the, the uh, I, I find that it's funny. One of the ones that for me is a funny one in that regard is the first sonata. It's not that it's terribly long, but the last movement is is challenging. You know, mm -hmm. it's technically there's a lot there's a lot happening there, and you can start to to play sort of mind games of uh, you know with it being in two parts, each part re repeated. So it's like okay, you've gotten through the first movement, you've gotten through the fugue, and you're through the Sicilian, and it's like okay got through the first half, now I've got through the repeat of the first half. And you know, you start seeing the finish line and that's a da dangerous way to play. You'd mentioned Paganini before that you did a lot of Paganini growing up. So you've recorded the Paganini Caprices a while ago. Do you think you would redo them at some point? You know, I, I recorded those twice too. It was my, oh, my, first, I'm sorry. <laughs> my first album, that the, the first thing I recorded back in 95, I guess it was. Okay. And so that was uh, Paganini Caprices and then back in, 2009 I think it was I recorded them again and uh, and I still I still mess with my wife with that like every once in a while when I feel like it's been long enough that I can get away with it I'm like you know I think I might record the bag movie she's like no 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 <laughs> I mean the preparation for the 2009 recording was was intense it was sort of like you know I feel like I was like training for a, some sort of you know of the Olympics or something um I don't know, you know, the, the thing that's a little bit, I guess, I know that with that recording in 2009, that, um, that I worked, I prepared for that as hard as I could. And I, I am, I don't really, I, I haven't listened to it in, well, probably a decade, maybe more. Like, I don't know if I've ever really listened to it after I approved the master for release. Cause I, I was like too, it was too mm -hmm. close. Um, and I, I know I'm proud of what I did. And I know that I, that what I did was, was the best that I could do at that point. I, you know, there was no, there was no question of like, well, you know, if I, had, my schedule had been a little different or if I would prepared a little more, or if I'd scheduled the sessions a little differently, it was like, no, that was, that was what the, the, I did that I feel like I can hold my head up high because I, I did it right the, the way I would have wanted to. And uh, so in a way, it's like I kind of don't want to listen to it because it's been 12 years. Surely there will be things where I'm like, hmm, I wish I'd done it this way instead. or I wish I'd done it that way instead. But realistically, um, I don't really play a lot of those pieces anymore, which is kind of too bad. But you know the the music business has has changed, and and I've I've definitely witnessed um, the way that that things change as a, as as a soloist gets older. You know the type of repertoire that people mm -hmm. ask me for is very different than what they asked me for twenty years ago. Um, so so I don't know. I don't I don't anticipate that I will record them again. Um, I would like to think that I'm still young enough that I could do them as well as I did. <laughs> but, it, you know, if I'm not going to record them in the next 10 or 15 years, when I'm 60, I know I won't be able to play them the way I did when I was 30. So, yeah, um, yeah I, I don't know. But but it, it's, it's too bad that that music is not appreciated, uh, perhaps more by the, the, the intelligentsia, you know, than, than it is because, um, I think Paganini was a wonderful composer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the first violin concerto. I think it's a fantastic piece. I think it's super fun. It's really entertaining. It's beautiful. It's dramatic. It's funny. Um, and I don't think I've been asked to play it in like ten years because it's like, oh well, you know, he's in his in his forties, and we'll have him play mm. Brahms or Beethoven. And it's like, well, what am I going to say? Like, if someone asked me to play Sibelius Concerto, I'm going to be like, no. You know, of course I'm going to play. It. I mean, that's that's why I do this. I, I I love it. But but it's funny. Like, I remember one of the first pieces I played with the National Arts Center Orchestra was Vignowski Second. Mm -hmm. Great piece, fantastic Beautiful piece. <laughs> I mean, 
20 years. I think it's been 20 years since anybody's asked me to play that piece. And, uh, and actually, I, I know Joshua Bell um, last year, a couple of years ago or something, he just made a point. He's like, I'm going to play it. And he just basically told orchestras, he's like, I, I want to play this piece. And they said, really? He said, yeah. He said, okay. So he did. And I thought, well, that's great. Good for, good for him. Because, um, you know, sometimes there, there's this, I don't know, there's, there's, there are certain sort of delusions of grandeur in our, in our business. And, and I think that, um, I think that, you know, nobody, loves Bach and Beethoven and Mozart more than me, you know, I mean, I, I, I put myself in that, in that category of people that, that, you know, kind of worship at the altar of these, mm -hmm. these great masters. But, but I think that there's room for music that is also just kind of entertaining. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, it feels like a lot of programs these days are just so serious. You know, it's like, it has to be, you know, some, some, it, it, you know, there there has to be some you know B composer <laughs> Bach or Beethoven or Brahms and you know the most serious of that and then you know maybe a contemporary piece with a with a social context mm -hmm. and it, you know and it's like this is all great like yeah of course but you know it's it's a bit of a shame as a violinist that that we have all of this music, you know, that doesn't really get played all that much. And so, so I'm kind of excited that actually that, that I don't think that any of this has been released, but the next time that I'll be playing with you, um, will be some, some sort of more fun pieces. So mm -hmm. <laughs> looking forward to, to having a little bit of fun. I remember a friend of mine had done, um, master classes with Milstein mm -hmm. and he, his requirement was that everyone have two Paganini Caprices in their back pocket in case he didn't like the piece you chose to play from that day. He'd say, yeah. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> that's, wow. Yeah, that's... Uh, old school, right? Can you imagine? That's super, that's super, super old school. But, you know, I I, I, uh, I wish that um, I wish that more... I, I think, honestly, if, if more violinists were kind of growing up that way today, I think it would be a good... I think it would be a good thing. It's like... You know, I, I meet all these kids that, you know, I'll come across some like 16 year old kid who's like playing the bear concerto. And I'm like, yeah, have you ever played the Goiner Bison? And they're like, the Goiner what? I haven't yeah. heard of it. No. And it's like, well, that's too bad. <laughs> um, anyway. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your youth and your training, because you come from a pretty small place, Brandon, Manitoba. And then I know you went to, well, you, in your own words, why don't you talk a little bit about? Sure. Well, well, yeah, I, I grew up in Brandon, Manitoba, um, which is a great place. I, I feel lucky to have, uh, to have grown up there and had my, my family there for many years. Um, my father was the trumpet professor at Brandon University. Uh, my mother had, had been a ballet dancer. That was actually how they met. My mom was dancing and my dad was playing in the orchestra. Um, she, when, when my parents moved to Brandon, she, uh, was opening a satellite school for the Royal Winnipeg Ballet. So they, um, they were Americans and, and moved to Brandon, Manitoba thinking, oh, this, you know, this could be an interesting place to live for a couple of years. And they ended up staying there for almost 40 years. And um, Brandon University School of Music is a, is a remarkable place. And, and uh, you know, particularly at that, that time when, when I was, was growing up there, um, it, it was, I mean, I, I don't. I don't mean particularly in, in contrast to what it is now. It's a remarkable place now. It's just you know, I, I obviously I don't know it as intimately as I did then. But it, it was a really incredible uh, assortment of just amazing musicians that had been brought in. You know, it, it was the, the whole idea of the Brandon University School of Music was was really quite quite remarkable. That starting from the the nineteen sixties, um, this amazing man named Lauren Watson, he started bringing in world-class musicians, I mean, people from all over um, to create a, a school of music that, that was sort of the Canadian equivalent. I, I think of it as kind of the Canadian equivalent to like what Indiana University did in the States, mm -hmm. um, where it's like, sure, you know, you can go to, to Montreal or, or Toronto or, or, you know, any, any number of, of cities and kind of immerse yourself in, in that city environment. And, you know, that's what I did. I, I went to New York and say, like, I understand the value of that, but I think there is also a real value for the right type of student to go to a smaller place where there's an enormous amount of individual attention, 
um, very few distractions, you know, and you, you can kind of immerse yourself in that musical life. And uh, so the violin teacher at Brandon University was this, this legendary man named Francis Chaplin, um, who uh, was fortunately my, my dad's best friend too. <laughs> so um, my dad would never have had the nerve, I think, to ask him, uh, you know, oh, were you, were you listen to my little boy play, but um, there was a woman named Lise Elson. Do you remember Lise Elson? Yeah, I met her, yeah. Yeah, and she came through Brandon. She heard me play when I was, I was little, I don't know. I think I was eight, maybe you just turned nine or something like that. And um, and she called Francis Chaplin and said, oh, well, you know, you should listen to this boy. And, and uh, so I was extraordinarily lucky at this young age to be studying with the university professor who was quite incredible. I mean, up to that point, I had been studying with his students. <laughs> so, so I had sort of this rotation of uh, violin teachers because, you know, I'd study with one and then they'd graduate and I'd study with another and they'd graduate. Um, but anyway, so with, with Francis Chaplin and, you know, there were some of the other members of the music faculty that were like my, my musical family and my, well, my real family too. I mean, uh, uh, my pianist and piano teacher and, and kind of coach and overall guru man named Donald Henry and Lawrence Jones and, and these people, um, they, they took me under their wings and, and uh, yeah, it was, it was an extraordinary environment in which to, to grow up. And, and, you know, the, there were other kids the, from my town that um, you know, went on to extraordinary things as well. Like, I mean, it, we, it was not just like, Oh, I kind of, you know, people, they, they, they're like, oh, you're from Brandon. Well, that's so unlikely. What are the chances of a violinist coming out of Brandon? It's like, well, I mean, one of my, two of my best friends there ended up, you know, one plays in, in the, the orchestra in Stuttgart. The other is one of the concert masters in the Metropolitan Opera. You know, it's like, the, this was not an isolated thing. I mean, this, this teacher was, was a magician and the whole society was so nurturing and fostering of, of uh, what we did there. Um, Anyway, so my, my teacher, Francis Chaplin, had been a student at Juilliard in the 50s. And one of his classmates was Sally Thomas, who uh, he got in touch with Sally Thomas. And at one point, when I was in my early teens and, and uh, sent me away to Meadowmount to study in the summers uh, at the Meadowmount School of Music, where Sally Thomas uh, where, where Sally Thomas still teaches at Meadowmount. I mean, it's gone virtual the last couple of years, but she has not missed a summer in, I think, 75 years or something. I mean, just absolutely wow. unbelievable. You know, she went as a, maybe 70 consecutive years because mm -hmm. she just had her 19th birthday. And uh, anyway, so I went to study with her in the summers and uh, then continued on, uh, you know, I sort of you know, followed in my, my teacher's footsteps and, and for university went to Juilliard and continued studying with Sally Thomas there. And um, so, yeah, in, in a way, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of, of influences, a lot of tremendously influential people uh, in my musical life, you know, between you know, my, my father and this man, Donald Henry, I mentioned, and various coaches here, there and everywhere. And, uh, but but really, my, my only two main teachers um, of any kind of length of time were, were Francis Chaplin and Sally Thomas, and they uh, were students together with Ivan Galamian. So um, so in that sense, there's sort of a, a tradition, I guess, to the to the teaching that I've had. But but I think in in retrospect, two of them the the most remarkable qualities of both of, of these teachers are that they, um, they don't do sort of a paint by number approach. Um, they actually gave me an enormous amount of individual freedom. Um, and they gave that to all their students. You know, I, I remember being at one of Sally Thomas's studio classes where just by chance, it was like three kids that night were all playing Chausson Poem. And it was so interesting to me that in contrast to basically what would have happened at almost any of the other studios at Juilliard where they would have all been just like cut from the same cloth. Like they, the performances were all so different, you know, different bowings, different fingerings. Just, they were tailored to each individual student and, and they, Miss Thomas gave her students, you know, I, I think of, um, of her teaching being sort of like, um, you know, you release a horse on a track and it's a wide track 
there are fences on either side, you know, where if things start going a little off, you know, they, they will go down that path, but they can find their own route. And uh, I think that was a very valuable thing for, for me and really for all of our students. That's a really cool image, actually. Uh, that's neat. Um, I've heard you talk about your preparation, which it really resonated with me, that when you have the luxury of time, you'll prepare a new piece to about 90% and put it on the shelf and come back to it. Yeah. which I think is so valuable. I was curious, that 90%, does that involve memorization or still with the score, if it's something you're um, going to memorize? I think it depends. Um, probably probably with the score. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I, I, I find that it's like, I'm sure it's this way for many people, it's that last, whatever you want to call it, 10%, 5%, that um, it's the, that's the hardest part. Um, particularly when a piece is fresh and for whatever reason, you know, the mind is an amazing thing and there is a certain amount of work that continues mm -hmm. um, almost subconsciously. Um, and I've, I've come to recognize that, you know, there will be certain things when, I, when I'm learning a piece where it's like, you know, this is going to be better and it's going to clarify if I just let it sit for a little bit. So yeah, I do when possible like to to learn a piece and not get too worried about getting it to that very highest level. You know, I don't need to get a performance ready and then bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I just find like bringing pieces back in general, it just, it helps so much, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel grateful that the way my career developed um, allowed me to rotate a lot of repertoire um, as a young person. Well, because I just, I wasn't, I, I was never, uh, there was never kind of a moment for me where um, all of a sudden I was thrust into playing. You know, I didn't win some competition that then was like, oh, you've got 90 concerts next year after having like three the year before. Um, and that, you know, not saying that that can't work for, for certain people, but um, for me, it was such a gradual sort of buildup and, that uh, every season I could program something new. I could make a point of programming something new. So that piece got sort of added to my mm -hmm. collection, so to speak. And then and then the second time you bring it back is easier. The third time is easier still. And the fourth time is easier still. And so I feel um, I feel lucky that that, that happened because it, it allows me now to to rotate a lot of repertoire because there are a lot of pieces that are, you know, if you think of the, the brain as sort of a file cabinet, there, there are a lot of pieces that are permanently in, near the front of that file cabinet. So, um, you know, honest, honestly, like, you know, sometimes, sometimes the rotation of repertoire can get a little bit silly, you know, like packing for this summer, yeah, just a stack of music like this hot. I'm just like, okay, that's, that's a little excessive, <laughs> but, um, but when it comes to, you know, I, I think it's a little bit limiting to to be in a position where it's like, well, I'm playing Tchaikovsky for this concert, so all the weeks around that have to be Tchaikovsky. And, you know, there are some some of my colleagues and, and friends that, that they prefer to sort of do that. And they prefer to live in that world and kind of immerse themselves. But but for me, it's like I, I want it to, I, I, I guess I need it to be, a little bit more special, you know? So yeah, I don't wanna ever play a piece more than more than two, three weeks in a row. It just gets, I feel like it's impossible for me to be as excited about it by week four as I would need to be. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm always gonna practice, no matter what piece it is, no matter how well I know it, I'm gonna practice it because I feel like, I mean, it's my job and the day that you don't is the day it doesn't go well. You know, it's, you, you, you have to practice, of course. But, but you know, if I'm playing Mendelssohn, well, I mean, like, for example, this just happened, like, like, a couple of weeks ago or so, I was playing Mendelssohn on a Thursday, and then the next Thursday I was playing Tchaikovsky. And, and there were some people that were like, oh, you know, should we coordinate this repertoire for you so it can just be the same piece for both? And it's like, well, if it's the same piece, I'm still going to be practicing every day and honestly like the amount of work that it would take to get Tchaikovsky performance ready is not more work than it would be to keep Mendelssohn performance ready so what you know doesn't matter really. Mm -hmm. 
when you're a student like teenager and, and Juilliard what was the rate of um, digestion of new concertos I'm curious like as a virtuoso coming up how um, much repertoire was it your teachers giving you well it, um, I, I you know it's so hard to remember mm. um, I I had a a a, a strong appetite. <laughs> so I think that my teachers um, wanted to um, wanted to indulge that, I guess, or, or wanted to, I, I don't know, you know, work that to to my advantage. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I learned a lot of a lot of pieces, you know, I was just kind of churning through a lot of repertoire. I've always had this kind of weird kind of collector's view of things too, where it's like, well, if I learn a Mozart concerto, well, I want to learn all of the Mozart, you know, it, it's, I don't know, it's just part of my my mindset. I don't know why I like collecting things or something, but so um, I was playing a lot of repertoire and, and Sally Thomas, you know, as I was in my, you know, later teens, uh, she, I mean, she, she knew me, she knew exactly who I was from the beginning and we, we've remained very, very close over the years, but she was so funny because she knew exactly how to push my buttons and exactly how to make me work. And so she would just sort of she would sort of casually throw out these these sorts of challenges like, oh, well, you know, I'd be at summer camp. It's like, well, you know, there's there's this open slot at this performance next week, um, you know, and we were talking about it at the faculty meeting. And, you know, I thought, oh, you know, if only it were a week later, because then Jimmy would have the time to learn the piece. But of course, it'd be impossible for him to do it on such short notice. And then, of course, I'm like, no, no, I can't. I can't. And she knew what she was doing. So, um, so yeah, I was I was. Um, I think that that because of my personality, I think that my teachers saw the value in feeding me a lot of repertoire, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, the value with certain students where you might want to really focus in and, and deal with the, these issues of, of, uh, of refinement. Um, you know, I think that, that you, you just have to know, you have to know the student and what they're capable of and what their own levels for, um, refinement intrinsically mm -hmm. is because you know I think that there are some students that they get a kick out of kind of 75 percent learning a whole bunch of pieces but they never actually really learn mm -hmm. well <laughs> um, but then there are some students that's like they get so bogged down where it's like what you went to university and you learned like three pieces in four years you know that's that's not great either and that's not realistic right I mean like you know that that uh, I, obviously a job as an orchestral musician involves just such an unbelievable amount of, of repertoire. You're just constantly digesting things. And I think that, that sometimes uh, I, I've seen, you know, and I, with, with friends and, and, and kids that I've, that I've followed in, in more recent years, like this real rude awakening of, of the kid that spends, you know, their entire fourth year preparing their graduation recital and that's all they do. And then they graduate and they win a job in an orchestra and they're playing more music in the first two weeks than they've learned in the last two years. And, and that, that's very difficult. And it's hard. People don't realize orchestral music is often very difficult. Of course, yeah, it's like yeah. super hard. And, 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 it's, and I, think that, I think that sometimes like the, the orchestral violin parts they're particularly hard because some don't you find like some of the busiest stuff and most technically challenging stuff is not the stuff that you necessarily have in your ear from 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 hearing performances of the piece you know i think about like um i've I, i've in i've asked for conductor friends indulgences over the years to you know sit in orchestras and, and kind of play the repertoire and i always think of like like in Mahler symphonies the hardest, hardest, hardest passages are often the ones that are really nothing more than texture. Mm -hmm. So you're not like, oh, well, yeah, I, I know, I know Mahler six, because I've listened to a lot of recordings of it. And it's like, the passages that you're going to work on the most are the parts that you've never paid attention to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you are known for, of course, your beautiful sound and great musicianship, but also fantastic intonation. You just play so beautifully in tune. Thank you. But I, I wanted to ask you about that because when you play with piano, it is different than when you play with an orchestra in terms of where the notes go. Mm -hmm. Or do you, do you make those adjustments? Um, 
You know, I think that there's the, the yeah. I mean, there's. I guess I feel I feel kind of of two minds about it. I feel like um, yeah, to play with really good intonation, you 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 have to adjust to the circumstances in which you're playing, and and you know there are there's sort of different kinds of intonation. You know, there's chordal kind of vertical intonation and there's there's linear mm. melodic intonation where, you know, sometimes you hear quartets get into that sort of thing where it's like, it's vertically lined up so well, but all the melodies sound a little wrong because <laughs> it's like, they don't quite fit right. And everybody in the group is like worried about, you know, where do I put the third? Mm. And, you know, you know, I'm going to tune my C string up and, and, and it's like, it just turns into this kind of craziness. So in our quartet, we laugh about this a lot that, that sometimes it's just like, just play into it. Just, just play into it. Like just stop, just stop it. You know, or the people that are like, yeah, well, you know, when I play with piano or I play with orchestra and it's like, okay. Yeah. But also at a certain point, it's like, nobody plays that well in tune, <laughs> you know, no, nobody is really like, and also we have the luxury of vibrato, right? Like, I mean, that, that the, the, the spinning of the sound in the air. So, so intonation is, is tremendously important. And, and I, I really appreciate the compliment because it's something I think about all the time. And I mean, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that, that fuels good intonation is just, being constantly paranoid about it, really. <laughs> um, but but I think that I think that with with intonation, I mean, it, really, I think a lot of, of of when when a person is playing, that one of the most important tools you can learn is is objectivity. You know, mm -hmm. and, and really really trying to listen to oneself as part of the ensemble, or trying to. Or even if you're playing on your own, how does it how does it sound? Not how does it feel like it sounds? Not how does how do you think it sounds? Not how do you want it to sound? Those are all very different things, and and, and that's it's such a fascinating thing to work with students on, you know, because it, it's you know we've all had these experiences of working with with these you know, great talented young people where you see it, like you see it in their faces and you see it in their bodies, like what they're trying to do and what they're trying to say. And it's sometimes a very delicate conversation to be like, it doesn't sound like that. <laughs> you know, yeah. you think it does because you feel it so strongly, but what's coming out is not what you're putting into it. And, and that, that learning the relationship between what you do and what comes out, I think is, is one of the, that's one of those, maybe the most important step, right? From going from student to professional. Um, but I guess the other thing about intonation is like, I, I, I think from a technical standpoint, I am a big, I'm a big believer in, um, in hand position. Mm -hmm. Like I, uh, I want to always know when something goes well, I want to know why. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really analytical about the way that I play in a technical sense. Um, and uh, is I feel like the better I understand why something works, the easier it will be for me to replicate it. Um, yeah. So in terms of having a very, very solid hand position and knowing the relationships um, between the different parts of the hand, you know, there are always parts of the left hand that are um, anchored in one way or another mm -hmm. and like how you know, I remember just just the other day talking to my, my nephew. is is an aspiring young violinist, and you know, he's he's just kind of learning how to shift. And I was talking to to him about it, and more importantly, to my sister, who's in charge of teaching him about how it's it's not always about knowing where the note is; it's about knowing where the hand goes and how the finger fits within the hand. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we all we all do that, right? It's like, you, you know, if you're, you're shifting up to, like you say you got to leap up to some high note, you don't always know exactly where that note is, but you know where the hand goes and you know how the finger fits within the shape of that hand. You know, where it's like, I might not know where the G is, but I know where the E is or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, I guess there's there's a lot of, uh, a lot of thoughts, but, but, uh, but anyway, I do appreciate it because it it's something I think about. I don't like, playing that's out of tune. <laughs>
As an orchestral musician, we often have to find very high notes out of the blue. We have to come in quietly, which is always a nightmare. I don't have perfect pitch, so it's like really a, like a stressful thing. But it took me many years to figure out the extension of a sixth, because when you're up high, you can find a lot of notes. You know, you get to fifth or sixth position, and then, oh, if I extend a six, I know where that is. So that kind of geography. Yes, yes, exactly. That That's totally what I'm talking about, where it's, where it's like, yeah, you might know where the bottom of your hand is. And because of that, you know how, yeah. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you, like you have long-term relationships with certain musicians. And I was just listening to your, I think it's called Stream of Limelight that Bramwell Tovey mm -hmm. wrote for you. Yeah. With, and you play with Andrew Armstrong, with whom you've done so many beautiful recordings. Can you speak a little bit about those relationships? Yeah, well, well, first with, with Bramwell Tovey, um, Bramwell, his first uh, music director job in North America was with the Winnipeg Symphony. Mm -hmm. And uh, Winnipeg Symphony was the, the closest thing I had to a hometown orchestra. I mean, by prairie terms, it was just next door, you know, only, only 250 kilometers away. And um, anyway, Bramwell, uh, yeah, he came there in, I believe it was 89, I think. And um, my father, for, for those, those years, for many years, was uh, sort of the unofficial fourth trumpet of the Winnipeg Symphonies. They, they carried three, um, and if they had use of a fourth, they, they'd bring my dad in for Brandon. Uh, so my dad had a lot of friends in the orchestra, that uh, some of whom had, had heard me play. I think I'd played some, some school concerts uh, with the WSO maybe in 1987 or eight. And, um, and they said, oh, there's, you know, this new music director coming to town and, you know, we should, you should have your boy play for him. And, and I was like, well, I don't know how to set that up. So, so his friends set it up and uh, we, we drove into Winnipeg and, and it was just the greatest thing is, I mean, you know, Bramwell Tovey and, and he's just the nicest man. I mean, he's so, so warm and, and, and wonderful and he's a great musician. He's a funny guy. And, and it, anyway, he really, he took me under his wing and gave me, um, many of my my early opportunities, um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the kind of core repertoire. I feel like I, I kind of um, I, I broke it in <laughs> under Bramwell's supervision, and uh, and we became great friends over the years, and um, have had a lot of wonderful experiences performing together, kind of all over the world. And I, I made my UK debut with him, and. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I when I was doing this tour uh, in 2016, it was it was my my birthday present to myself. <laughs> it was my 40th birthday in 2016, and and I thought, well, you know, I want to go on a tour all across Canada, um, to all the provinces and all the territories, and you know, not just because I think it can get to a point where um, just the the nature of the music business. You know, I've been living in the states for a long time now. I'm married to an American, and, and uh, at that point, um, you know, I was working with with managers that, that, um, that lovely people, but uh, like to them, I, I think Canada sort of felt like, well, Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, maybe Calgary. Mm -hmm. you know, what it was like, guys, uh, there's a lot more to it in places that are really special to me and really important to me. And um, so I wanted to, to go not just to not that I have, you know, it's always wonderful to be in the big major cities, but I wanted to go to, you know, places out in the Maritimes and places in the prairies and, and you know, smaller centers and a lot of the places that had really supported me growing up and, and been starting my career. So um, something I, I also wanted to do was, was commission a new piece for this and, and commission uh, a Canadian composer. And and so anyway, Bramwell, it was the most amazing thing. He, he wrote this piece as like a birthday present for me and uh, and so yeah that's that's Bramwell and we've remained very close friends and, and uh, I always always love seeing him and working with him and just he's, he's an amazing wonderful man and uh, and Andrew Armstrong the the pianist who uh, was on that recording who I've made a, a lot of recordings with is is yeah he's one of my one of my best friends and and one of my closest collaborators he he and I've been friends for about about 20 years now and um, and it's funny how how it started like he he, I'd always kind of heard about him through my student years because he was this pianist from Connecticut that um, I, my roommate at Juilliard was a pianist. He introduced me to Andrew Armstrong at a, at a concert one time. We were all at this concert at Carnegie Hall to see Ryder Lupu play. He's like, oh, you know, this is Andrew Armstrong. He's beat me at every competition through my entire childhood. <laughs> and uh, 
Um, so I knew he was, you know, this great pianist, but I really didn't didn't know him well at all. And Andy called me. I remember this in, in like fall of 2001. He was like, hey, you know, I've got this concert down in Miami and you know, I thought maybe I'd play a, a, a duo recital and, it, it, you know, I need to find a violinist to play with. And I mean, the whole thing was kind of weird. It was like, and I remember telling him on the phone, I was like, oh, you know, I'll have to check my schedule. I knew I was free. I was just like, this is kind of weird. <laughs> this guy calling me up. And um, I talked to, uh, I got off the phone. I, I talked to my, my girlfriend, now wife. And it's like, so this guy, Andy called me, asked me to do some concert in Miami. And she's like, well, are you free? I said, yeah. So she said, well, do you want to do it? I was like, I don't know. I guess I've always kind of wanted to go hang out in Miami. Um, she said, well, why not? So I went down and played this concert and uh, we just had the time of our lives. Like the concert, I remember not very much about, but I do remember like playing like three sets of tennis on the concert day. And I remember drinking a little too much beer and eating some really good barbecue. And it, you know, we just had such a grand time that um, that we ended up playing this, this same venue in Miami, like three, four, five years in a row or something until eventually it was like, you know, we could do concerts not in Miami. <laughs> and we started, it was probably not until about 2007 or something that we started playing together a lot. And, uh, and yeah, so just over the years, that's been, that's been a real joy, you know, kind of exploring the repertoire in great depth and detail with, with Andy and, and, uh, you know, our families are very, very close and, uh, you know, that's it's been a great a great pleasure and he he uh came with us for this Canada tour so for large swaths of the tour um it wasn't entirely linear but big sections we uh it was like me and Andy and my wife and my two young kids at that point in in a minivan <laughs> driving across the country you know it just it was a bizarre way to uh to spend our weeks but it was so much fun and uh Every year, Andy and I are like, can we do it again? Can we do it again? So I don't know, maybe when I turn 50. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that note, I just want to thank you for today. It's been really, really wonderful talking with you. Oh, well, it's my, my pleasure. Nice talking with you too. So all your many recordings and upcoming projects are all linked to, to your website, which will be in the description of this video. So thanks. Thank you.